There we have uh, Mr. Ferretti by telephone. Joseph? Good morning, everybody. Mr. Schultz has joined us as well. Mr. Larry? Glad to be here. Thank you. By the way, the... Uh, the betting line on your topic today has sunk <laughs> on Facebook in the chat community. They pretty much have you pegged. Uh, Alonzo Perry. Good morning, everyone. And we welcome back our first half hour holdovers, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield and Delegate Michael Height. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Before we get started, why did Joe Ferretti try to get me disqualified today? Yeah, what happened there? Yeah, Joe. Yeah, Joe. Uh, you, you, you posted... Before Rob gave you the green. <laughs> <laughs> That's a protocol violation, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the other thing before we get started, uh, last Friday uh, when I was not here, uh, some comment was made Stubblefield's chair, and Hornby was very quick to pop up and said, it's not Stubblefield's chair, it's Hornby's chair. <laughs> so we've worked out an agreement. I pay him a fairly sizable amount each month so I can sit in this chair. But, I, but, but he's making it clear I'm renting the chair. It's not my chair. In Mr. Hormie's defense, at the end of the year when they plop that business and inventory tax on him, he's got to claim those chairs as, as something that he has to pay an inventory tax on. So in his defense, it is yeah. technically his chair. So, Hey, uh, yesterday was baseball's opening day. I'm, I'm sure baseball fans uh, around uh, our area, especially uh, Orioles, Nats fans, uh, whoever else you're a fan of out there, rejoiced in the start of baseball once again. Uh, as a uh, Pirates fan, I rejoiced in the fact that we're eliminated by April the 8th each year, but <laughs> we've got some young talent coming up. We've got, we've got hope. We've got hope. So uh, I thought uh, for the theme today, uh, we would take baseball – into consideration with our theme. So the last sentence of everybody's intro will be a Yogi Barraism. A Yogiism, right? So I looked up uh, Yogi, Yogi's top 20 uh, Yogiisms, and I've incorporated five of those into your intros today. And, and might I say, each of the Yogiisms has been chosen especially just for you. I'm, I'm lost. The so way gratifying. Yeah. And, and, and I'm Alonzo the, doesn't even know who Yogi yeah. Bear is. He's <laughs> like the guy with the picnic basket? Yeah. The boo -boo? I mean, Yogi Bear sounds familiar, but. Not uh, Yogi, Yogi Bear. I mean, that's. Uh, we're, <laughs> Yogi Bear was a New York Yankee who was oh, famous my. for his malaprops. And, the uh, funny thing is that a yogi is a teacher of yoga. Yes. Yeah. And then, the, you know, there's a certain. Um, uh, clash between Yogi Berra, as I recall him, yes. and anything to do with meditation yoga. or yoga. Because <laughs> he couldn't yeah. have been thinking too much when he uttered some of the things that... I just want to thank Alonzo for making us all feel old. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, let's go to Mr. Tone Loke to start there us off. We go a little something like this. Hit it. Oh, Larry, you're up first. Well, it took until baseball's opening day in a New York minute that made the Donald pay. Oh, somewhere Larry Schultz is just so excited because Donald Trump has finally been indicted. But will the Donald go to jail as many have doubted? Well, as Yogi Berra once said, nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's what we like. <laughs> Alonzo Perry is in the Mike Carl seat this week, and that's a seat where you sit and can't be meek. Alonzo Perry won't shy from Republicans in power, but mostly he'll take on liberals over the next hour. <laughs> Alonzo Perry's living for a day he's yet to see, because as Yogi Berra said, the future ain't what it used to be. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I will make sure to do full research on you. <laughs> oh, you got to do your Yogi research, baby. Yeah. You can't go through life not knowing through who Yogi Bear is. Mike Height voted no when it came to that marriage bill because it's one thing to vote to allow Jack to marry Jill, but it's another thing to vote to allow children to form a bond. And that's a union. You just can't wave away with a magic wand. Mike Height entertained us all session long with his hot takes. But when it came to that marriage bill, as Yogi Bear has said, we made too many wrong mistakes. <laughs> Here, here. He's been living in the South, trying to determine what is real, watching candidates marching with signs that read, Stop the Steal. If Joe Ferretti was a betting man, he'd bet against the chump that claimed the message would be stale that was delivered by Donald Trump. And so just like the game ain't over till it's won, as Yogi Berra said, this message won't be over till it's done. <laughs> 
Excellent, Rob. Excellent. <laughs> you know, you got to let those yogis kind of float around the room sometimes. It takes a minute till they land. But when they land, you go, eh, it's pretty good. Most recently, Bill was asked to tell some famous stories about his former Admiral life and his former Stubblefieldian glories. He dazzled the crowd and made them laugh and made them smile. And closed with a gem, he said they should remember all the while. Wisdom can be found by walking through open doors. And as Yogi Berra once said, always go to other people's funerals or they won't come to yours. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, collectively you did well. <laughs> you're right. You're on stair stairway to heaven with these two. <laughs> You know, I had a good writer. <laughs> Yogi Berra took care of the punchline for me in each one of those, so the, uh, the first five flow easily after that. You know, he was a phenomenal catcher uh, and Hall of Fame and the like, but he's best known for yogaism. And there's another yes. one right there, yogaism. Yeah. <laughs> yogaism. <laughs> you invented a new word. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. <laughs> My, the way I butcher the English language, there's no challenge. You know what? Well, you know what? You're still second because Craig Blair made up a new word on this show once called fruitation or he's talking about <laughs> something that was going to be coming to fruition he called it fruitation i think i was i was out yeah. there listening and, 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 and rob never forgets <laughs> i do remember i do remember is, is craig blair from an apple family from one of the orchardist families maybe they have know. a special yes. lingo yeah. it could be <laughs> but I, I i enjoyed that one and we did not let craig get away with it what he did we go to issue number one and for that we go to joe joey toots ready our leadoff hitter on the day after open Day. Rob, with your undeniable talent, I beg you to let me enter into your uh, contract renewal negotiations with Mike Hornby, oh, it's, your it, agent. It, it's uh, yours. I, I just want, it's totally yours, especially I, since I found out from Travis Bajant yesterday, agents only take 1% or 2%. Here, yeah. I thought you guys were taking like 10 or 20 <laughs> One well, or 2% hold, hold, is all hold. yours. Hold on. That, that's a misconception. <laughs> Here comes the negotiation. I, I think lawyers should do the same thing. With the cut that you guys take, 1% or 2% seems fine for an agent. should be okay with the attorney. Yeah. You're, you're not going to get away with paying me 1% or 2% to sit down with Mike Hornby. <laughs> the legislature just did it for free. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's hazard pay. Well, well look, I, I, uh, I'm a giver, okay? And I, I like to think of myself that way and I'm going to leave the Trump indictment to my good friend Larry Schultz because I know he's just jumping at the bit, even though that was my number one topic. I'm going to let that go. That's generous. And I, I thought we would examine this uh, relationship between the county council and uh, the lobbying uh, company that they have. <laughs> Um, no, I'm, I'm just joking. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's too late. Summer Barrett just swore. I, just, I heard that one all the way from her house in Martinsburg. <laughs> let's let's go to um, the uh, uh, another school shooting in Nashville, which was my number two topic uh, that I posted last night. Uh, well after the uh, appropriate time to do so, uh, the shooting was um, uh, interesting to me from one re in one respect. I, information came out that the assailant was suicidal, was posting online about uh, a, a, an important day coming, uh, that it was all going to end for her and, and things of that nature. There was a manifesto that she left behind that police are still kind of pouring over before they report out on it. And it struck me that uh, this often comes up in the debate on red flag laws, that uh, sometimes these people leave breadcrumbs that are discernible uh, and recognizable before the awful event that they carry out. And I'm wondering, in this particular case, if we should be concerned about reporting coming out that uh, a, a close companion to this assailant had called a suicide hotline to report this behavior and to the threats that this person was posting, again, all before the shooting. And when she called the suicide hotline, she was put on hold for nine minutes before she could actually speak to somebody live. That the parents recognized that this young individual, the assailant, was also acting strangely 
uh, and had threatened herself and others, and that they notified law enforcement before the event occurred at the school. And law enforcement did not respond to the reports for hours. Yet we know that the law enforcement behaved uh, appropriately and bravely, I should add, in how they responded at the school once the shooting started. But it was the run-up to this event which caught my eye. And I thought about this in the context of these red flag laws. How many of these incidents might be interrupted, uh, might be thwarted, if we took reports that are out there from these uh, potential assailants if we took them seriously, if we were able to respond appropriately, if we had a mechanism in place through the courts that provided due process, but also provided an opportunity for law enforcement and others to interdict and to stop these uh, assailants before they commit their ugly acts. I, I think it is still a matter of debate in this country, and I think it's a debate that needs to continue, and that's the debate I want to have this morning. All right, let's start first with Delegate Michael Height. Well, I, I would say that I, I believe that most gun advocates or Second Amendment advocates don't have a problem with um, some kind of mechanism uh, to remove these guns from people who are showing these mental health issues. If there also with that mechanism is a way for um, due process, and I'm glad you mentioned that in, in your opening, um, th th that's one of the biggest problems with, with red flag laws is there's no due process. So, you know, I, I can accuse Alonzo of something, and next thing you know, somebody's coming and taking Alonzo's guns away from him without any verification of what I'm saying. So, and I think that's where a lot of uh, Second Amendment advocates um, have issue with that there has to, Alonzo needs some kind of due process before you just come and take his stuff, um, whether it be guns or anything else. Um, and, and that's the problem sometimes you have with, with red flag laws um, in their context right now. Um, I, I would have to agree with you, Joe, that, that it seems like there were a whole lot of breadcrumbs here. And, and why um, no one acted is beyond me. It, it seems like we're um, very reactive in this, this kind of issue and not very proactive in this in this kind of issue. Somebody should have been at least investigating and, and looking into the situation, especially when you have second uh, second party uh, individuals calling and they're calling not just uh, suicide hotlines, but also calling uh, law enforcement. Um, and that's an indicator that law enforcement needs to be getting involved. But I also believe that, that we need to secure our schools better than they currently are. And, um, you know, there needs to be some legislation to that effect and to make our schools a whole lot safer than they are currently. Larry Schultz. Um, the first thing that occurs to me with the last thing that Michael said is, um, of course, this is a private school that was attacked. This isn't a public school. So when we say we need to protect them. I presume that's the church that runs that school needs to protect those schools. Um, and, and the reason I bring that up is um, most of the time, obviously, most of the schools, most kids go to public school. Um, and so most of the school shootings take place in public school settings. Um, but this was a, a little bit rare in the sense that it was a private school. I'm sure it's happened before. Um, there, but there's a broader, it seems to me, a broader issue we need to take cognizance of here. And that is, um, these are weapons of war, these assault rifles. And is there a chance that person could have gone in there with a single shot revolver uh, and, you know, a single action revolver and, and killed five or six people? Yeah, but it, it starts to narrow out. When you have 30 shots in a magazine... And you can just keep pulling the trigger, and every bullet, as the Washington Post showed the other day, um, is going to leave horrible damage, if not death, because of the way the 223 round tumbles. And it was designed by military experts for that very purpose of killing the enemy. Um, if we don't do something 
about the availability of these guns to any person who comes along, um, we're never going to get ahead of this. In other words, you can't wait until the per- I'm saying you cannot wait until the person has four assault rifles, then shows suicidal tendencies, and then put your plan of action in place. It's got to start at the other end. There has to be somebody who, for a uh, person who wants to buy an assault rifle, will sign off. Some person of responsibility who will sign off and say, as far as I know, this is a great person. I've known him a long time, blah, blah, blah. A letter of reference. And that, of course, um, um, is not going to be a guarantee. But at least there's somebody in the community, a county commissioner, a former admiral in the Navy, um, a, a, a sitting doctor who's treated the patient. I know that you um, didn't include a talk show host on that list of respectable people, Larry. <laughs> well, I would have gotten to it, but we use up the whole show. <laughs> and we don't want to do that. Uh, and so, you know, there's got to be some way we can do this. Um, you know, we don't give driver's licenses, and therefore the power to operate a vehicle to just every person who says they want one you have to be a certain age you have to get a permit first you have to be you know sort of trained by somebody else cars and guns are similar in that way i think mandatory insurance if you own guns would be a really good idea because that gives an insurance company a reason to take a look and say we we don't have a constitutional right to drive a car uh, actually, we got a freedom to travel that's not just limited to walking. But, of course, our constitutional right, I'm glad you brought that up, is the right to bear arms. And we're involved in a whole bunch all over the world of arms control treaties that deal solely with nuclear weapons. No one's suggesting that the individual in this country has a right to nuclear weapons, are they? Those are arms. Why? It says it right in the Constitution. How do we sort that out? We use courts. And we use our legislature to make some definitions that go beyond what the writers of the Constitution wrote. So, for example, there's already a line. You can't own a machine gun without special permits and and all kinds of extra red tape. And beyond them, you can't own a tank, uh, not one that will fire missiles. You can't own a drone that will shoot down aircraft. Those are all arms. But somehow we've just decided, well, as long as we stop short of fully automatic weapons, anybody can have them and they can take them most anywhere. Um, we need stricter laws with regard to this, and I don't think it will violate the Let me get the bill's double field, Bill. Yeah, uh, Joe, you've asked a very uh, thorny question, and just the comments today shows both sides of the issues. Uh, one, the uh, uh, limitation of our guns. Uh, Folks like Larry, and and I'm in the same category, uh, would wish there would be more restrictions. That's not going to happen, though. The Our uh, legal system, or excuse me, our Congress is not going to limit, I think, at this point in time, unless there is unless the problem becomes magnitude larger and i hopefully that never happens the other side is uh more mental health screening uh more social media screening more dollar uh more uh for hotline uh uh, tightening our our security around the jails, excuse me, around the schools. All of those are good things, but everyone costs money. They cost a lot of money. Uh, our 911 uh, group is ta- uh, overtaxed as it is. Uh, these uh, suicide hotlines frequently are overtaxed because if we're using 2020 vision of saying someone was 10 minutes late in responding, we forget the fact that there's not enough resources to respond to all these needs but yet the flip side of the coin is we're not prepared to spend additional money on our schools we're not prepared to spend additional money on our mental health screening this has been proposed but it's not going to happen so what do we have we have one side that are not going to uh, uh, restrict the the purchase of guns. The other side will say we need to do this, we need to do that, but there's not going to be the resources to make it happen. So 
it's going to be business as usual, unfortunately. And that is business as usual is going to require or going to result in more and more people killed. And I and un, and really, really unfortunate about all this. So often it's the children that are the victims. I would sure like to find a solution, but I see these two conflicting views. Neither one are going to compromise. In one case, there's not enough dollars. The other case, it's uh, uh, the uh, the argument for the Second Amendment, and they're not going to compromise on that. Alonzo. Well, there's not going to be any compromise because it's it's really just a, a, a silly notion, right, to, to entertain that, you know, there needs to be some type of red flag law or something for, you know, this particular issue, simply because uh, when we have early intervention, and then what? Okay, we, we, we take their firearms, we put her in a mental facility or him or whatever their pronouns are, and, and then from there, and then what? We cannot legislate away evil. People are going to act whether we want to or not. And I, I feel terrible for the families that have lo- lost their child. I feel terrible for you know the, the, the families that lost a teacher and, and uh, this horrific tragedy. But you know, uh, I wanna thank the heroism of law enforcement who was there in minutes, you know, when this event was happening. And I also want to talk about, you know, uh, what is the data is saying, right? There is zero shootings inside of schools where uh, the teachers have the ability to be armed. There's zero percent. There's uh, the rate of murder in this country is 56 percent of people that are convicted of felonies. 56 percent. That's more than half of all murders. And they have some of the most stringent gun control regulations put on their person. It doesn't work. You know, it, it, it's not so much that uh, this isn't a problem that doesn't need to be addressed or, or we can't go back and forth on, on how to fix the problem, but we fundamentally disagree on the premise that is being set here, that there is something that we can do physically to some structure, some me- mechanism to legislate away, I mean, just terrible, egregiously bad behavior, and that's just not the case. Comes back to you, Joe Ferretti. Well, I, I, I'm a little dismayed to hear the defeatism in, in, in the group. I, I understand the heavy lift that there is in trying to deal with this problem, but I, I, I can't accept that kids being mowed down at school is something that we have to accept for our society. I just can't accept that. We have to, if it takes money, then find the money. If it takes effort, if it takes a, a court system that ensures due process, uh, to, to ultimately save a few lives of these kids going to school, then, I mean, let's try. 21 states have red flag laws. Tennessee does not, but 21 states do. And, and it's, you know, we've got right now uh, a laboratory situation going on in this country where we can see if that works. And the, and the data will come in eventually, and we'll find out if it works or not. But at least we're trying. But to sit back and and collectively shrug our shoulders and say, oh, well, this is just American society. Good luck, kids. Um, I I just can't accept that. So I'm looking for ideas. I know gun control is an issue that's out the window because there's over 400 million guns in this country and we're not going to control them. But, you know, with rights come responsibility. And I'm calling on the NRA, and and I hope Art Tom's listening. You know, it's great to advocate for guns, and it's great that Missouri passed the law that there's no age limit on owning a gun in Missouri right now. I mean, that's, okay, great. You you know, your constitutional rights upheld. Um, But with those rights come responsibilities. And when we show as a citizenry that we can't handle those rights safely and effectively, we have to do something. And I hope that we'll continue to examine issues like red flag laws, and eventually vote them up or down. But let's take a look at some of these efforts that are being done to to thwart this mayhem that unfortunately now has kids afraid to go to school. If you're worried about CRT and you show up at the school board meeting, you know, all the power to you. You have a voice, you have a right. But my gosh, you know, talk, sit down and talk to your kids and ask them what the real threat is going to school in their minds and try to deal with that. I, I think that's what we have to get is a mindset in this country not to give up. And that, that was the point I wanted to make. The kids are in the capital of Tennessee today, I understand it, uh, or late, late yesterday, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah uh, 
And you're right, Joe, this, this is when you talk to kids, this is a big concern for kids. And I think because we as adults will never find a solution to what we're debating here today, the only response is to be armed in response. I think every school needs to move to have some type of armed security on campus at all times, whether that's a sheriff's deputy or a private uh, security force that's well-trained and ready to defend. But that's where we are today in 2023 because this other stuff it isn't getting solved anytime soon at uh, 9 12 joe joey torts ready joins us via telephone and in studio the admiral bill stubblefield the sarge delegate mike height alonzo perry in the mike carl seat and the always charming larry schultz sporting full beard <laughs> ready to rumble and with issue number two we go to the admiral rob i'd I plan to ask a question, has a portal been good for college sports? But after listening to the discussion around Joe's question, I'm going to go with something more serious. Uh, I look at the the polls of Trump and DeSantis. Uh, Trump's poll numbers are going up. Uh, and far and in excess of the 30% of hardcore people said they're going to vote for Trump regardless. Uh, some of the polls show him as much as 40 45%. DeSantis on the con- uh, uh, in contrast, the last few weeks has started going down. Uh, two questions I guess I'd like to ask the panelists. Uh, one, what do you make of this? Uh, and why Why do you explain Trump's numbers going up, DeSantis going out? The second question is, if this trend continues, will it make it, uh, will it broaden or tighten the field of potential candidates besides Trump and DeSantis? Well, as I said last week, when I want fair and unbiased analysis of Donald Trump, I go to the man at the head of the table. <laughs> a fair and unbiased analysis of Donald Trump, Larry Schultz. <laughs> I'm very happy to provide that, that exact kind of analysis. Um, I think it's more likely that a few more Nikki Haley types will uh, announce candidacies to run against Trump especially with yesterday's news out of New York and what I suspect is forthcoming news from both Georgia and the United States government um, on some of the other cases that what, are pending. What was that news, Larry? Well, the, the news... Uh, you know you want that, to say it. That, that the former president has now been indicted, uh, presumably for felony crimes. Yes. Uh, we're going to find out more about that. But as that goes along, there will be people whose hope to be president you know that's dwelt inside them for lo these many years it will be irresistible to say come on there's got to come a point where when this guy's convicted of a felony his numbers will finally fall right and they will con- even if that's not true they'll convince themselves of it and they'll get in the race so i think it only stands a reason that there'll be a half dozen or so uh mini desantises out there um trying to just if nothing else await out the outcome um it's true that donald trump could run for president from jail um a a famous uh american labor leader eugene v debs ran for president back in the early part of the 20th century uh, and got over a million votes from a little place called moundsville west virginia where there was a federal pen once upon a time a little uh, history uh, no larry you answered the second part uh the first part you did not address why do you see DeSantis numbers going down relative to trump well people are just finding out what he's really like and he's uh, not he's a little uncomfortable when it when he's asked a question that he hasn't had a chance to prepare for and so i i think people are finding out that they're not going to have near as much of the fun they like with him as they will with donald trump you know, the, the, the people who are tr- big Trump fans love to see him go after people and attack them on a personal basis. We don't have very many politicians who will do that. And uh, so that keeps Trump popular. Alonzo. Well, I think it actually came from Trump's criticism of DeSantis. I think that that's what uh, had arose in any kind of drop in his poll numbers. I mean, he brought up some pretty interesting critiques of, you know, his governorship, talking about, you know, the violence in Jacksonville, talking about, you know, uh, that a lot of the numbers that were um, happening with COVID were, you know, detrimental to Florida. And, you know, a, a lot of his critiques, I think, were, you know, 
of sound basis. And I think that a lot of people were kind of starting to, you know, look past the PR of Ron DeSantis. However, I will say that I think that Ron DeSantis will be able to lift his poll numbers back up. And what I actually hope is that this is a unification event for uh, Ron DeSantis and Trump with this indictment. Because uh, if you had seen in the news recently, Ron DeSantis refused to extradite Donald Trump if New York wants to, you know, bring him there for their prosecution. And uh, I think that that's a an interesting way to extend an olive branch to his camp. But I think that, you know, these guys are both uh, fighting for the right cause, for a good cause, and a cause I believe in. And I hope that, you know, together um, they could work something out to maybe have Ron DeSantis as his VP. And maybe this will kind of bridge that, that gap right now in this ruthless, you know, primary that we're going to uh, be ready to witness. Joe Ferretta. Well, I guess Ron DeSantis must have slept through the class at Harvard Law School where they taught constitutional law because he has no right to refuse extradition of Trump. Uh, the feds would, would remedy that position in about two minutes. Uh, so I, it's just pandering, which I think is what Ron DeSantis is good at, is, um, is pandering to certain constituent groups uh, and, and you know, Disney taught him a little bit of lesson uh, this week uh, about some of the things that he was trying to impose upon that major employer in the state of Florida. So uh, Ron DeSantis has a, a bit of a Scott Walker quality to him, the, the governor from Wisconsin, who, with much fanfare, uh, signaled that he was going to run for president and fizzled out in about a New York minute. Uh, I, I I, I think that uh, DeSantis has a little bit more going for him because it's Florida versus Wisconsin. So uh, he could, still has a chance to be formidable going forward. But I don't think there's ever going to be reunification between Trump and DeSantis. I, I think the only way DeSantis is going to uh, boost his poll numbers and show that he's viable is he's, he's got to be anti-Trump. Because uh, 30 percent uh, of Trump followers are never going to abandon Trump. So DeSantis is going to have a carve out some way to win primary election. And I don't think that's being uh, a Trump mini me. Uh, so it'll be interesting going forward. But DeSantis has a lot of work ahead of him because he's got to mold himself to be somebody that Trump isn't, which is perhaps politically, uh, socially, in terms of some of the issues, he, he's the same. But he's going to have to show that uh, he can be Trump without all the drama. And, and I think that's where he's going to go. Whether that's successful or not remains to be seen. Mr. Height. I would have to agree with that assessment, Joe. I think DeSantis has to try to portray himself as the sane, rational Trump. Um, and, and and that's where he's going to have to go. However, I think it's way too early in this um, to, to look at polls. Um, many of us have, have been watching uh, presidential elections for years outside of Alonzo. Um, I've been watching this for years and know that it's. <laughs> I, think, I think we should move my chair to the other side of my life. It's it's way too early to to take a whole lot, put a whole lot of stock into polls and where things are. That that if if you watch enough of these, you see that that somebody like Larry says a Nikki Haley could could you know a year from now be the front runner and you just don't see a lot of times these these individuals come out of nowhere and make a name for themselves and get a whole lot of push and you don't know what's going to happen with trump over the next six eight ten months um to a year with with this indictment so you know if if something does happen and he's no longer one of the candidates then how does that open things up for everybody else who becomes the front runner at that point as far as DeSantis numbers dropping um, how much of that is attributed to again the indictment of Trump and and the investigations of Trump and people rallying back to his his cause because they feel like this is political yeah, Mike, uh, I agree with you. It's early, and you have to take the polls w with a grain of salt, a huge grain of salt. That that we realize, but you can well believe that the uh, the potential candidates, other candidates, are looking closer at the polls. Also, the funders, the donors, if you will, are looking closer at the polls as well. So even though it's early in the process, the polls are going to change. Sure, there's a lot of folks paying credence to them as we speak. 
Sure. Is and that your back to you, Bill, or do you have something else? No, that's that's back to me. I'm finished. Oh, let's go to issue number three, and for that we go to the delegate known as Michael Height. All right. I'm going to uh, to go into a topic here that's more local. So we've had record surpluses, record tax breaks, record job growth. So my question is, is West Virginia headed in the right direction? Joe Ferretti, you lead this one off. Well, I, I think in many respects uh, we are. Uh, and I have to give credit where credit's due. I think the Republicans have uh, – uh, done some remarkable things for the state of West Virginia in terms of the economics. Uh, and I think that uh, they have, in some respects, uh, w- with the tax cuts and with uh, some of the other issues that they have tackled here since uh, assuming power in 2014, have proven to be beneficial for the state. Uh, and it's undeniable that you know some of these businesses locating here in uh, West Virginia are, are due to how our state government has approached these businesses and been uh, accommodating to them, sometimes to a degree that we might criticize in terms of how they hand out tax breaks and money. But overall, uh, again, it's undeniable that the, these businesses have chosen West Virginia and, and have done it for reasons that uh, uh, in some respects are laid at the feet of the legislature. So I applaud that. Uh, I I will add a caveat, of course, which is, uh, as Mike Hornby pointed out last week, be careful that you don't let hubris and and, uh, the spoils of success uh, go to the point or an extent where you start imposing laws and doing things in this state that are not what the majority of West Virginians want. Uh, And and we can see that happening in certain respects uh, in in some areas, uh, hot button issues like abortion and, and uh, guns and things of that nature, uh, where large constituent groups uh, were opposed to what the legislature was doing, and they went ahead and did it anyhow. And there was a lot of criticism about the, the lack of committee work and the lack of public hearings and, and taking evidence and testimony in public so that these issues of the day could be aired. Uh, so, I, I, you know, with that small caveat for the legislature, uh, Mike, I, I agree with you that in many respects, it's hard to say that West Virginia is going in any direction but the right one right now. Mr. Stubblefield. Uh, yeah, and uh, Joe hit a lot of the points I was going to make as well. Uh, and, Mike, we all applaud or we all recognize as record, sur- uh, record surplus- surpluses uh, in job growth. My question is, if we look at this in the absolute sense, the answer is yes. If we look at it in the relative sense, then I don't know if our – uh, the our income uh, is unique at all because thanks to COVID dollars, all states or not maybe all, m- vast majority of the states are experiencing the same thing we're experiencing in West Virginia. So you can carry this argument only so far uh, that we that our record surpluses are a product of our legislation or our looking ahead, uh, and that's to some degree right. But also a lot is credited to the massive amount of federal dollars that came into West Virginia and every other state that uh, that uh, uh, peaked or not peaked, but uh, uh, boosted our revenues. Mr. Perry. Well, I think that the the GOP, especially, or I'll, I'll just say the whole legislature, I think they held, did a great job um, financially. I think that you know um, we're starting to to see trends of growth in the state that are you know going to have implications for my family and you know down generations down the line. Now, uh, one things that I want to see in order to really say, speak in the affirmative that the legislature is going in the right direction is structural changes. Uh, our Constitution is, you know, a, a depression era constitution with a lot of pro, pro a lot of uh, that's provisions. From, that's from sitting next to stubborn. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> and, you know, I don't have my coffee this morning. It's, it's you know, but no, I'm just going to blame Bill. There's there's a lot of provisions in there. That Come I, on, for ready, take up for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was trying to stop myself from you know making a, a big mistake, but no, but any provisions. Uh, that I think that do need to be altered. You know, there's things in in the education section that need to be changed. There's things that are um, 
even in the financial aspect with, you know, making one of the, we're one of the hardest states to manufacture in because of some of the issues with our constitution. So um, I think if we trend towards reestablishing uh, a lot of those portions and uh, continuing to, to pursue, you know, the social conservatism that people are moving into this area for, um, you know, they're fleeing from these blue states. So to say that, you know, the things like abortion or whatever, they don't support what West Virginia is doing on it does not fall in line with the data set or, or with the trends in people moving in this area and uh, the state of West Virginia whatsoever. So um, I, I think that we are going in the right direction, but I think that those are the, the, the really aspects that we need to nail down or to make sure that we're, we're really trending in a good direction. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Um, we were talking earlier about potentially increasing uh, the security uh, footprint at our schools. But the fact is, we can't even fill the security uh, uh, footprint at our prisons. And we can't fill the child protective services workers' positions and the adult protective services. Uh, once we've done those things and we're still in great financial shape, I will be uh, much more impressed than I am now. One of the things we did was cut taxes for everyone in the state while ignoring child protective services, adult protective services, and the jails. Um, we're not gonna be able to come up with new money to make the schools more secure if we can't pay for the people who are already here uh, who are adults or, or children who are in, in terrible strain. And so I wanna see when the re revenue side uh, plays out against the spending side. It's easier to cut taxes than it is to find new money to pay for things that our, that our state desperately needs. So to me, the jury's out. I want to first uh, compliment Delegate Michael Height for not doing the cheetah and, and springing <laughs> over the table. <laughs> And going right, to come and going right, Larry. I was, I was watching. I was watching height, and it reminded me of when you're you're training the dog to not chase that ball, and, it, and it's just going. I, I want to go. I want to go, but I'm going to hold back. And it, it it just doesn't go. And you give him a, you give him a treat. So Mike, I'm going to give you a treat. You go ahead. And, you go ahead and, and respond now to Mr. Schultz. Well, let me first say that that there was money allocated for CPS workers this past legislation. There was money allocated to make schools safer this past. Uh, legislation uh, we we haven't forgotten about uh, the correctional officers and, and I know that's an issue and that's why I, I set up the the trip to the the local jail to try to address that with with the other delegates to see what their issues are and I think that's something that's going to be addressed I, I think there's a couple different issues here when you look at it and and I the question I asked was was based a lot on uh, the fiscal aspects uh, of what has been done in the legislature and but there are two aspects there's a fiscal aspect and and there's a social aspect um, and and I think fiscally the the legislature over the past you know decade has done very well and and West Virginia is going in the right direction um, but there are some on my side of the aisle that believe that there are social aspects that need to be addressed as well and and when you talk about abortion that's one of them so there are there's some of those social aspects that we do feel like need to be addressed and we are addressing those a little bit at a time but i think that's you talked about delegate hornby and his his you know saying let's be careful let's be careful not to go too far right um that if we go too far right there's all, all always the the, uh, the fear that maybe that we allow um, the more liberal Democrats to get back in power because we've gone too far right in a lot of different aspects and and I think that's why the 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 left lost a lot of power is they went too far left and they weren't the the West Virginia Democrats of old where they were more moderate so there is that fear and you have to be careful there are some very radical um, legislators on the right down there. There are individuals who don't think women should be wearing uh, pants. They should all be in dresses. You know, so you have to fight back against those types of individuals down there. Um, You're not making that up either, brother. I am not making yeah. that up. And, you know, sometimes <laughs> when you hear some of the, the, the stuff that comes out of, of their mouths down there, you just shake their, your head and you're like, wow, I, you know, this is almost fascism what you're talking about 
Luckily, they are a very, very small group of people, and uh, I hope it stays that way. I think socially and fiscally, West Virginia is going in the right direction. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm proud of the things that, that are going on um, in the state right now. I want to ask a question based on something Larry said, and that was uh, in regards to the fiscal health of the state. And I think Larry is implying that some of that health is based on we're not hiring uh, people to fill these open positions. I think you pointed out earlier that that money is already appropriated and budgeted. And because the corrections department is down, say, 60 officers in Martinsburg, it uh, doesn't add to the surplus because that's money that the department already has. Yeah, the money's there in, in their budget to, to hire these individuals. So you don't count that as surplus if they don't fill that no. position? No, those are, those are not surplus. And, and that's, that's an issue around the state and a lot of different um, positions around the state that there just aren't the people to fill those positions. And that's not just a, 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 a government issue. That, that's in the private sector as well. I have the same issue in my own business. Mm-hmm. Alonzo, you were shaking your head about Republicans should not go too far right. Well, because I, I think that it's just... Uh, and now you have a Nutella the Hun sticker on yeah. your car <laughs> for, for delegate. It's it's a ridiculous notion. You know, I mean, take, uh, for example, the, the transgender uh, bill that was just recently passed. And there was an amendment added to it that it, it really wasn't necessary, right? But a lot of legislators thought, you know, this is a, a reasonable compromise to make sure that, you know, we can at least start on something, right? You know, they probably thought it was too far right to, to not have that provision or that amendment in there. And I fundamentally disagree. I think that it's common sense to say, hey, maybe we shouldn't allow kids to, you know, mutilate themselves or, or get uh, life altering hormones that are destroying their bodies, you know. And um, so, what amendment are we talking about? The the Tabuco amendment to um, House Bill, I think it's twenty eight eighty two. I think I think that the amendment that was added to it, it it's ridiculous, and um, it's not so much that you know uh, there are aspects where you could say yes, yeah, sure, there there are just crazy people that have crazy ideas, and that's fine. But but just characterizing it as you know that is just far right or there's something that there's this element that's just out there we can't define it you know it's just it, it's not uh, it's not something that I can agree is is a positive thing. Uh, there are social conservative issues that people care about because they see it as a threat to their way of life and what they find important. 60 seconds Bill. Well we, you need to get Joe in sometime I don't think he's responded to this one. Yeah yeah I thought Joe he started it off. Oh did he? he? Okay okay yeah, yeah. uh Alonzo, fundamentally, I disagree. Tell me how to run this show. <laughs> Put you on my list right now, <laughs> Stubblefield. Let me, let me, let me, well, the I was big looking X beside your, your name for next week. I was week. looking out for my buddy Joe Freddy. Uh, point that you made earlier uh, that uh, implied that people were uh, coming in the state in droves because of our social conservative issues. Well, the last uh, census indicated that's not the case. People are leaving the state. I, I'm not saying they're leaving because of the social uh, conservative issues. That's incorrect. That, I have to interrupt. That is absolutely incorrect. That people, that the net migration of the state of West Virginia is positive. There are more people moving into West Virginia than are moving out. We just have a higher death rate than we do people being born. And that's why we're decreasing in population. It's not because of the migration. But but we do not have this massive migration coming into the state just because of social conservative issues. No, we I'm have saying old it's people. net positive. Unhealthy. But we have old people, yeah. retired people coming into the state to buy cheap real estate yeah, in places like exactly. Great Capen. And we have young people parting ways with the state forever. That's going to mean that the whole death rate versus birth rate thing is going to get worse and worse and worse. In other words, there's something to what you say, but it's not all that great. And on that take, we head to the break here. Joe stays on the phone. And when we come back in the uh, next segment, it'll be Larry Schultz who leads off our uh, next topic. As we move on to issue number four, we go to attorney at law, Larry Schultz. Yes, and this goes back to the um, the school security issues we talked about earlier. Um, does anyone on the panel believe um, that teaching children uh, of young school age t- the run, hide, fight, um, means of dealing with an attacker at the school is causing any psychological damage or, or can cause psychological damage to these little kids. And the reason I ask it is a, a personal anecdote. 
a friend of mine who has a daughter who we'll call Becky, who's six, she recently had to go through red alert training in her school. And she came home with some questions, as you might imagine a child would. And they got down to it. And what she said was, well, what if I do all those things and it doesn't work? And the father told me he couldn't answer the thing because he couldn't keep his voice steady. And so, as often we find in our families, the mother, being the stronger one, said, you're going to tell him your name is Becky and you're a good person. It's just a heartbreaking thing to think about a six-year-old who's terrified of non-existent monsters that come and get you in your sleep has to worry about real monsters in their school. Um, it, it, does the training Is the training going to make that better or worse? I guess is what I'm asking. All right, I've got to go to somebody whose years would denote sage uh, wisdom on this one, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. And, and Larry, I cannot answer your question, and I don't mean to belittle your question by when I was a child, we did the same thing, but it's the fear of Russian dominance. So we would have these drills that everybody would hide under our desk and in fear or anticipation of these bombs that never came. Uh, I don't think I was psychologically damaged. Now, my kites may say that I was. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think but it's it was, undeniable. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to examine his school records, actually. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so, so I cannot really address that, Larry. I'm not a psychologist. Um, it's, it's a legitimate question, an honest question. I don't know the answer. The old duck and cover drills. Bill, yeah, right? exactly right. I learned that from uh, the Russian bombers coming over. I hid yeah. under my desk. I, well, I remember being taught that, too, yes. when I was in elementary yeah. school. Cool. Now, are you psychologically damaged? I do this for a living, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I wasn't before, I am now. <laughs> Alonzo. Well, I mean, you know, uh, we have fire drills at school. We, you know, and I, I don't worry about just spontaneously combusting, stop dropping and rolling, and you know, uh, the fear of just some some fire happening. So no, I don't believe that there will be any psychological damage from just being prepared. And you know, I, I think that the training is is actually a positive, right? I think that you know, to to feel like there is something in place, or or there's a protocol, there's there's a, a type of training to know how to deal with this problem is fundamentally, you know. Uh, one of the most things that you can do to to engage someone that is you know could possibly be in a traumatic situation think about the military you know uh, you're just constantly trained on an, a, a topic or a, an issue until you know when that event happens it's muscle memory you know but you're not six you're not six and, and i do I, I i i can i can you know uh he can see sympathize that with that, but it's it's still a, a a thing that that should bring comfort not only to the six year old but to the teacher to feel empowered to be able to say I'm going to protect you know these children and and I am instilled with what we should do in the case of this event you know uh, it doesn't hurt to to make sure that there's protocols in place to you know provide uh, safety, Mr. Height. Well, first of all, I think um, children are much more resilient uh, than and than adults are in a, a lot of cases, and they adapt very well to to certain situations. And I think the the thing you have to tell the children is, you know, we're here to protect you, and um, the teachers have to take that aspect. We're not going to allow this this to happen to you, and this is how we're going to protect you, and that's how you sort of have to uh, address it with the kids. Um, but as legislators and and as uh, Berkeley County School um, Board members, we have to have the mentality that this is not going to happen in our area. And we have to take the steps to make sure it doesn't happen in our area. And that means we have to prioritize making sure that our schools are safer and it is more difficult for somebody to walk through the door and, and gain access. Um, and, and I know it, it, a lot of people don't like it, but I am a proponent of of campus carry, um, especially in, in elementary schools. I, I believe that that adults should be allowed to carry. Um, teachers should be allowed to carry. I will bet you if you ask any of those teachers where there have been school shootings, that when the school when when the the shooting started, ask them if at that point 
they wish they had had some kind of weapon to defend themselves and their children. I'll bet you that the vast majority of them would have said yes. I think we need to allow teachers, administrators to be armed if they so choose, um, and, and they have the training to do so. Mr. Uh, no, go ahead, Mark. Go finish. Ahead. Go ahead. Mr. Ferretti. Well, I, I, hearkening back to those hide-under-your-desk days and, and running to the fallout shelters and schools, I, you know, there, back in the day, there was a bit of a disconnect about all that. You know, a 7-year-old or 8-year-old doesn't understand geopolitics and the Russians and who the heck were the Russians at that time? But, you know, you didn't comprehend the danger as much as we as these kids do today. And one reason is because of the Internet. You know, an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old can go home and look online and see images of kids holding hands, crying as they're led out of a school because some of their classmates just got slaughtered. Uh, and, and the information that's available to these kids uh, through their own ingenuity of searching online is such that it's there's that disconnect isn't there these days it's it's it, it hits home much more easily so i do r- wonder about the psychological effects that have on these kids uh going to school uh you know it was reported that uh on the security video uh as they're watching this this assailant uh, walk through the halls a, a child can be heard in the background saying i want to go home uh there was a time that the the safety of our schools were equated to the safety of our homes, and, and such is not the case anymore. In fact, it's the opposite. And uh, I, I just think in, in this day and age, it's a whole different ball game than it was when we had to worry about nuclear war. It, it's a, you know, that statement there, it's a heartbreaking one. Larry's uh, had a couple of those uh, today, too. And I, I just want to come back right to what we to talked with um, in the last month or two with Sheriff Nate Harmon about, and that was working on some type of legislation that would allow more deputies, uh, also uh, maybe retired military folks, retired police officers, uh, that type of security that is uh, at a school or within close proximity to a school. You know, I'm, I'm a coach at a high school, and every day when I drive up to that school for practice, there is a sheriff's deputy's car parked outside of the front doors that already are security doors, but he is parked there every single day. And if that's what it takes, if that means we've got to buck up to make sure that every school is safe like that, that's what we have to do. Because we're not, again, we're not solving this problem the other way. One of our listeners uh, responded on chat, uh, Stacy Burkett, in direct response to Larry's question. As a kindergartner, I was terrified of being in the fire after touring the firehouse. I had nightmares for weeks. Every kid handles something their own way, exactly right? right yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kids are resilient, but they've had a heck of a time bouncing back from the COVID restrictions we had that they had to live under while they were in school. So that resilience that was, only goes that, so far. We don't want to get started on that topic. That's another Friday. Because <laughs> <laughs> we go now to our final discussion item with issue number five at Alonzo. Well, I know that uh, everyone here is an avid user of TikTok. I know that that's your go-to just, app for Just fun. like you know your Yogi you know, Bear is, yeah. we know TikTok. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, I wanted to open up the floor um, with this new federal piece of legislation. It's called the Restrict Act, and it's being advertised as a TikTok ban, but Uh, It has some nefarious provisions, such as authorizing the Secretary of Commerce to review and prohibit certain transactions between persons in in the United States and label citizens as foreign adversaries. Do we believe TikTok should be banned? And if so, is this how we should do it? Larry Schultz. Um, I'm not a big fan of outright bans of this sort of stuff, but I would use whatever pressure I could to make sure that the 150 million alleged users of TikTok in America were not having their data mined and handed to the Chinese government. I do think that our government has a right to step in if that's what's going on. And I would shift the burden. I would put the burden, you know, generally we think if the government makes an accusation, the burden of proof is on the government to prove it. I would shift the burden. This is private industry. We can uh, regulate it as we see fit. And I would say it's up to you to prove to us that it's not happening. 
And um, if they can't do it, then adios. Um, I don't want these social media companies farming our data to our adversaries overseas. Plain and simple. Billy? Yeah, and, and TikTok adds another dimension. That's what's, what it's doing for training and planning in our children's minds. A different thing, and we've all heard this, and what they're doing in China, the same organization. Uh, I think the Secretary of Commerce currently has that authority. I could be wrong, but if they do not have, Secretary of Commerce is the appropriate place to do this because it it's, uh, deals with international commerce, and that's what this is. Yes, it, it expands their abilities. Uh, so it expands it, and then it also gives it to where uh, if you try to put in a, a Freedom of Information request to see if you were like designated yeah. as a foreign adversary, you can't do that. They're, they're not going to show you. And it's, it's, it's basically the Patriot Act, but just being expanded on. Mr. Height, uh, I'm in a, in agreement with Larry here. Um, he's odd, he's easy know. to agree with. Um, <laughs> that, but I want to take it a step further. I don't want to ban TikTok. I think it, you get into trouble when you start naming applications and platforms. I think you have to be a little bit more broad and say any application, any platform um, <clears throat> that foreign uh, countries have access to the data um as a as a government entity um need to be banned um that it's it's china today but it could be russia it could even be the uk or france or some, even one of our, our friends we don't need any foreign company or country um mining our personal data and and storing it for whatever reason that they need so i i think we need to if it is if it has has access by a foreign country at all, um, I think it needs to be banned as an application. Mike, it's interesting that you and I picked up on two different aspects of this. You picked up on mining our data and sending it back to China. Mm -hmm. I picked up on the educational component to the children, or to anybody, but most of the children. Uh, both of them, I think, are equally dangerous. Joe Ferretti. I agree. Well, I always find it interesting that in China, uh, if you're on TikTok, uh, it automatically uh, stops on, on your phone or whatever device you're using it on. It, it stops, I think, in 45 minutes, whereas in this country, it's unlimited use. Uh, now, <laughs> the Chinese uh, have long not cared for their citizens, but uh, I find it interesting that they had that protection in place, whereas we don't. Amongst any other, uh, amongst a bunch of other national security threats that arise from this, ByteDance is the owner of TikTok. ByteDance is a Chinese company that clearly has demonstrable ties to the Communist Party in China, uh, and so there's the concern. And and I like what Mike said. I think the message has to be to not only uh, the Chinese Communist Party but other foreign adversaries that this country will be vigilant with regard to Internet platforms that you provide our folks uh, that could be used for nefarious reasons. And, and, and the data mining that uh, could take place here with, with TikTok is a concern. The testimony of the uh, CEO of TikTok before Congress here about a week ago was, was not compelling with regard to TikTok's position on this matter. Uh, I think a lot of the senators found his explanations wanting. And so I expect Congress to act. Uh, and I, I think, by the way, uh, Alonzo's concern about citizens being labeled as foreign adversaries uh, in some relationship with TikTok, uh, that happens all the time in this country. We do have citizens who are really foreign adversaries. We just had two people sentenced over in federal court across the street from my office who were passing secrets in peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, who were foreign adversaries, but they were citizens of this country. So uh, I hope our country remains vigilant in that regard, too, and I hope the laws allow for the appropriate prosecution of people who are acting as adversaries. Joe, since I haven't had dinner since 7 o'clock last night, I'd like to refrain from all public mentions of food on the show until after 10 o'clock, please. Especially the peanut butter and jelly thing was back when he was a kid, and, and it's really difficult. I had a really big peanut butter and jelly sandwich yesterday. It was delicious. Alonzo, it comes back to you. Uh, well, you know, I'm, genu I'm genuinely um, concerned about 
the provisions in this. I think that it's, uh, you know, it, aside from that, let's let's talk about, you know, first, you know, the CCP has a big red phone in every corporation there, right? I mean, the, the government there is in control of their corporations. They get to direct, you know, who's the CEO, what's going on in the company, what their objectives is. And I think that that's why, you know, this is scary. It's also unprecedented that this is the uh, social media site with the largest uh, influence, you know, outside of an American social media site, you know, so uh, their goals and what they're trying to obtain is, you know, it could possibly be a Trojan horse. We have no idea. Um, and then lastly is, you know, TikTok itself is malware. It's, it is spyware. It, it, it's it, sure it's an app that has, you know, videos on it and, and producing stuff like that. But, you know, American companies have that same type of role without the uh, implications of data mining and also controlling you know the the information that our kids are looking at with it and we all made really good points but i think that banning tiktok has to be a, in the affirmative now how we get to that goal is you know up for debate did you say all large companies are controlled by the federal government in no in china in, this, in china in china i'm it, sorry ccp okay, yeah. okay it's a direct okay, okay. Yeah. good enough yeah. thank you yeah the the uh the tiktok issue at any time that we have the senate which has, has an average age of like 107 interviewing anyone <laughs> who's dealing with social media apps anything with technology it cracks me up because i know they have no idea what they're asking about when they ask uh these questions other than the fact that a 25 year old staffer gave them the question to ask but you get rid of TikTok, and, and, and they will. We, we will ban TikTok in this country, but that doesn't mean that it stops. Yeah. There are ways of getting around things, and there are plenty of other apps out there that do the same exact thing and send that information over to China as well. well it's but not just TikTok. This, I think is, this is one. I, I think that's why you have to, if you're going to create laws, it has to be about any app that does that. It can, mm -hmm. You can't specify TikTok. Um, and, and it should be not just foreign adversaries. Our, our domestic government shouldn't be collecting any data as well. Our own country shouldn't be using apps in that fashion. Eight seconds apiece for final thoughts. Get them together. We come back after this. Uh,